Thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks to Chick-fil-A and Firewood for inviting us to participate. Um, so, as Heather did such a great job explaining a little bit about what we do, um, Purpose Possible exists to help the leaders and the program staff of mission driven organizations to focus on the work, focus on the mission. We can support um, all the other stuff that kind of gets in the way communication, strategy, fundraising, team engagement, long range planning, and that sort of thing. And this is just a sampling of some of our current and recent clients. Um, we work with about 125 organizations right now across 25 states. And we have offices based here in Atlanta and D.C., but we work with organizations and health consultants based all over the country. Awesome. So before we jump in, though, do you want to see the kind of things that you want to do? So what's going on? How can you help a new organization? Awesome. You all are our people. We are here for you. We are ready to get started. Who is between a million and five million dollar budgets? Okay, awesome. Fantastic. Who is a better five million dollar budget? Okay. Okay, so a little bit of a spread here. Uh, how many people are on a development team or a team? Well, let's start with who is on the development team? Who is the executive director who is the development team for the Also, it's very helpful to know because I think some of what we're talking about today is really about strategy development, right? It's thinking about how you're approaching what needs to happen for your revenue development and resources for your organization. And knowing the size and capacity of your organization can really shift the way you're thinking about that strategy. What types of activities and tactics are going to prioritize from here? So it's helpful for us to kind of have a sense of that and think about it. So, really quickly. Suzanne is going to jump in really quickly, but I was going to say, you know, it's after lunch. We hope you all are energized, talk, ask questions. We're going to do some call and response. We know y'all know how to do that. We're excited. Yes, absolutely. So, you all can say this, but we're, you know, it's not going to be fun, but I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we can sometimes, um, which is a part of the two organizations. We have to take a little bit of different development So we want to accept that we're working with the type of organization that we can. It's, it's a little bit harder for us to really get a feel for that. So what I would say is if you have any questions on that afterward or in the Q&A, feel free to ask. But for sake of getting our food, we're going to focus on that third of your revenue that we're working with the type of organization that we work with. Okay? We're going to do a pop quiz. Be ready. People are sorry. Right, so we're going to do a pop quiz. From <laughs> All right, and it's typically here. How much do U.S. nonprofits raise from private philanthropy? Let's take a quick look at the quick frame. Right, I saw a hand too much. All right, yeah, I think people said B. Probably a large percentage. <laughs> I think realistically, it's probably a good, a good I don't have that exact percentage, but it's a good, it is a fair question. All right. So, four sources of private philanthropy based on the percentage of giving. How would you raise this smallest to largest? So, across foundations, corporations, individuals, or the government? How would you raise that? Keep this in mind. Foundations also include civil advice companies as well. So, with your mom, how would you say it? So, this is something to think about. I want to ask you very two questions because they're always a bit confused by the end of the day, and it is not the end of the day. All right, so let's take a look. Smallest corporations at 4%, and that number 
keep doing that, then the way they can send you to the That's from the science. Uh, it's a request at 921, followed by donations at address the proposed cancer site. And then Yeah, absolutely. So one of the interesting things to think about in relation to this huge liver of corporate to this much larger kind of swath of individuals is that every year, somewhere between four to seven billion with a B in the employee matching funds from the corporations is left. Um, 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 requested. So, the number one easiest, simplest way to get corporate dollars is to have a question about does your employer provide matching funds to every single place that you get individual payments. That's the key to getting additional corporate funds without spending a ton of time and energy on a relatively small part of the pie. Absolutely. And time going after corporate dollars, and it's not even the use of that. So, just thinking about that, right? It's all as you were thinking about the real capacity to develop your strategy, think about where you're going to be really investing time and how to develop this strategy. Which kind of happens to be the same time that you have to do this? I'm going to say if there are any arts organizations in the crowd or in the rooms today or online, um, arts rates fairly low, and that usually folks are pretty, pretty surprised about that. You think about the big arts organizations in your community, you think that they're kind of money, and the big ones probably are, but the teeny tiny ones, you know, that do a lot of work in individual neighborhoods around the community probably are. Um, and that is actually that disparity in arts funding continues to increase. So um, just be thinking about that. And then also over the pandemic, health and human services, you know, shot up. So you may see a little bit of rearranging of these kind of sectoral rankings over the next couple of years as we're seeing the emergency funding from COVID, you know, wind down or stop completely. Thank you. 
the collaboration partnerships, they can take the community across in terms of programmatic impact. And it includes a lot of skills starting a little bit, but collective impact is something that other communities are interested in. And we really want to see where that can increase the risk across the board of community impact. Indicating and communicating. This is also a big thing. Or if you want to speak to that in terms of what I've ever done. So, you probably seen some of these reports over the last couple of years where trust levels between individuals and nonprofits have actually been falling in recent years. Um, and so, for organizations like you all that are working hard and you're doing great work and you're making an impact in the community, being really clear and consistent about that messaging. Um, Helps to you know sort of dispel some of those trust issues. You create a relationship with people where they feel like you're talking to them, and then they're like, "Oh, they're not trying to pull anything over on me. I know exactly what they're doing all the time with their money that I'm giving them." Yeah, and sometimes that also looks like having kind of a group of kind of conversations with your fundraisers. And one of the things that can be really helpful is when something is not going well, like. Um, but you still want to show up to that company again and that the things that you arranged are going to be wonderful for them, but it's still going to produce some other, you know, really other services for them. Like people make sure that the back of the company just wants to ask that one minute because they have like no room to be like, yeah, I can't stop there, it's going to come from. But I think if your fundraiser is not going to feel that and they feel insecure, they don't feel like they're going to get it, it is helpful to also be clear. Part of that health care thing that Lori mentioned is having some transparency on what is happening with your organization. You don't want to be in a room all the time, but being open about sort of what is happening and how funds are being spent is a good point. And I think it is a good way to develop that strength and element of your fundraising relations too. Um, and then relationships. I think, you know, a lot of times I think that's another big theme. Uh, it can be a little bit transactional, right? It is something like you when you're sending out like probably one of the biggest vendor segment of communication and then going to these meetings, it can feel very process oriented on the surface. But at the end of the day, you guys are trying to work with people and it's all going to be the case. So that sort of commitment is really important to me. Yeah, and we talked about this on the virtual QA and I mentioned a little bit ago. It's a lot of your board members and your teams, volunteers, and staff that you're going to rely on to help you with your fundraising. Um, you all, you know, you probably do that a million times. You've made that once. But your average board member, especially if they're younger and newer to being on a board, they're really scared. They're embarrassed. They don't know how to do it. They feel uncomfortable. They feel like they're tackling their family and friends. And so, Really being able to help them understand that it's not a transaction, that you are inviting your friends and family to be a part of a mission, not just a transaction. So helping sort of reframe that fear into a positive, um, again, reestablishes trust on both sides. Yeah, that's so great. Some of the other pieces I think here that I would like folks on your board to think about some is a huge one. I think that going into your roof seeing a major focus for them is still, I think we are moving into a space where trust based philanthropy is going to be important a little bit, but within that, there is still the better our ability to be able to afford to be with the community and with your friends and family is going to be more that friends are power is still a profound part. Also, study adaptable. I think that's another thing that we're really seeing is that resilience in general now is much more so than sticking to what you've done for the last 15 years um, as being the sort of thing that, well, that's, you know, you have a bad history that could work working. But actually, the openness to innovation and how you are adapting programs is actually seen to make the comfort with your ways adaptable. So I think this one at least for that to it. All right, so resource plan is huge. So one of the, some of the things we want to make sure we're thinking about with this is how are you setting it up, making sure it's being delegated, right? So whatever your tactics are, how is it being assigned? What are the deadlines? What are the time frames for these things? And you're going to look at it and realize you've had three federal grants and 
And you might say, hey, can you go out and have a mila all in the same night? That's probably a terrible idea, right? So making sure that your business is really structured in a way that is able to delegate that work is very important. For folks that work in or other smaller organizations, how does your board really critically involved in this too, right? So are you at a size where you have a working board? If so, how are they doing kind of really clear uh, directives in terms of what needs to happen in your in your capacity responsibility? Um, also making sure of what are the requirements and things that you're going to need to make a budget. Um, it's going to also help you save some time and money overall because you can be more efficient in how you make decisions than you are here. If you are realizing that the do that is a good time to take those off. At the same time, it's also a good to keep in mind to look back and see what went right this last time. What, what did we do good to get direct mail campaign that we did last year? We're getting less and less of those envelopes back, but you know, sending out a text all the way to folks is better than nothing. And that actually is going to be pretty high rate of return on those. You should probably be looking for new ones that are back. So, how are you guys with using the data to really help drive that logistical recovery back to the end? Um, it's also going to help you with communication. So, show of hands really quickly. How many folks on the development team feel like you are speaking into the void when you don't do things the way personal staff or otherwise can talk about it? Right? So, having some of this clarity of planning is also important, but making it so that they can that the rest of your team understand how your work is supporting them, what that looks like, making sure that it's a very active human student and it's really critical. Um, and again, protecting your part of this is being able to have a plan for a program to raise up a script that you're going to share and what it looks like, whether that may be you know, really articulate what is your prioritizing, what you're prioritizing this year, so that you can focus on your best days. Okay, folks are thinking about this. Yeah, so um, when you're thinking about creating a plan and any of the subsequent tools that you'll put into these throughout the year for your fundraising activities, you always want to stay grounded and driven, you know, focusing on your key mission, vision, values. And that might sound like it. But if you can put those up as guardrails, they actually can help to protect your time, your staff's time, your board's time and energy. It really can help you focus and can use your mission, vision, and values and your purpose to set that. It's really tempting if one of them, you know, a partner or an organization that works with your community reaches out and says, oh my gosh, there's a huge hole of great opportunity. And if you were not in on it together, you could get, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Does it meet your mission? Does it meet your values? Is this the right partner at this time for your organization? Do you have the capacity to pull off the program that you would be signing up for? And can you report on it? So, using those key components as a way to stay hyper focused and kind of cut through some of the clutter. And, and, you know, you can kind of use it as a cover, as a way to say, you know, yeah, I would also add to this is a really key point for folks to do with your plan as well. Using your organization's strategic plan and share it into your solar plan or to your annual fundraising plan is a really critical key factor that you can add to. It's going to show that you're clear on exactly what you want to fundraise for, what the priorities are for the organization, how the kind of action plan and how that is going to end up. All right, so this is just. This is probably obvious, but it's so good to say. Like, as you're looking at your budget, what do you need? What are the gaps? And what do you need to for you to fill the gaps? So, some of this is going to be what are those recurring choices that you may or may not have multi year grants for? What are the things that you have in other partner groups that have a high rate of retention? How much do you feel good about it? What is, what maybe is, it's a little bit scary. And I know sometimes we have, we did have multiple location visits for this particular kid where, again, especially at this point where you know, the pandemic probably is going away or some setting is those times over and on it where funding priorities are changing. I think even just locally in Atlanta, there were eight funded 
actions that we can really put in strategic priorities in action. Um, things like that have a big impact, right? And so understanding how much of your budget you feel for particular items and what select spending is really helpful to go into the beginning because you never want to get to spend the board of 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 the board what type of data will be engaging for different types of apps? So, thinking about some of those instances we put, um, individual peer review data management, foundation, corporate, um, plus otherwise, particularly. So, annual funding is like just shoot your hands up if you want to know the old app. Who are we going to? Yep, that's right. That's always going to be our key. So, annual funding is fun, but also, Question. Is this your round? Is it the year? So, so again, how many of you all focus uh, individual giving strategy throughout the year that it is during these management plans? Well said. So, how many people of you target the majority of your annual funding missions between, I don't know, October and December? Okay. All right, so a little bit of a mix there. So, Thinking about those two, I think it's been mindful of, of that scheduling piece. All right, a new initiative that's going to expand your organization's program and impact in other ways. Where are we going? Oh, yeah, go for it. What would be your recommendation for the Yeah, that's a great question. So, this is something that, um, for anybody, especially that's managing like a major donor portfolio, right? You want to be mindful of your individual donor spread. So, who are going to be in that top 10 group, 10 to 15 percent of your portfolio? And then, how do you plan for those those donors to shift to the other donors? So, if you have a donor in your top 10 percent, especially, I would set it up to have a risk management plan where I know what my touch points with them are going to be throughout the entire year. Do we have a program that we're going through that works here? Do we have a targeted app that we can do a more focused kind of segment campaign through those individuals with that would be one great role? Is there a program launch date that you have that you're looking at? You know, education, do you have some more money? Because like graduation time frame for the year that you can run a special campaign. So that you can be really mindful of how does that, how do opportunities can get overlap to your programmatic really overlay that to donor touch points is a really key piece of it. Um, also, thinking about what you're segmenting your donors is a good opportunity to think about ways to divide that across the year, too. There's always going to be a piece that will help your folks that are going to the end of the year, and that's great. Often, though, what we see is when you have additional campaigns that are set up that are targeted to various opportunities. So, we are seeing right now a little bit of a shift from a typical um, kind of demographic segmentation of donors into more um, mood-based uh, segmentation, which is kind of interesting um, that the types of opportunities you have advanced or the types of program requirements that are happening with you, various things that maybe you would be able to respond to organizationally that are appropriate, that those are going to be opportunities to also be mindful of where you're thinking from additional pieces of your annual plan that can be, can be leveraged throughout the year. Um, so that's definitely something to be thinking about your segments and where you can do that. Does that answer your question? All right. A new initiative that's going to expand your program and impact. Where, where are we going? That 
crazy. What kind of foundation are you going to try to get about? Not specific, not that this is a foundation, but what types of focus are you going to have on your part when you have a foundation? So I think what I would what I would say there is we're gonna be working on organizations that have existing capacity to help with that building, we're gonna be looking at organizations that um existed specifically in something like that. So we're a time taken, um it's can be less of sort of so thinking through that as well. So being kind of particular about where you're focusing your foundation has so that you know specifically you're going to use foundations for this specific type of ask. Again, overlaying that for the strategic plan, what does that come up with? Does the fact that we are going to be asking you to put it on the other side of the That is a great question. So, realistically, we don't know what to do if we have to fundraise it. We know that it does. It's not decreased the amount of fundraising that can occur from this method. It's not, again, keep in mind that five to ten causes a year, right? It does not decrease the amount of the focus, but what I would say it increases the attention that people will be able to put on different types of behavior. So I would definitely be very mindful of, you know, the fact that we're not probably at the time when I'm going to have to spend the majority of my um, communication plan, or if you have to actually be speak to that coming piece. Yeah, I mean, I think you can think about it in like Susan was saying, if you have done some general segmentation of your capital plan, then maybe you're going to have to think about it again. There are probably costs that for many organizations and for individual donors are also going to go through the political process of your donor. So thinking about it through the election cycle throughout the year, when they are getting bombarded, you're probably getting I think it's something that everybody in the text messages from a variety of candidates and organizations. So when your inbox fills up, there's a tape. But if you have a critical need, you have planned a campaign, you like, I've got to get this message out, think about how you can be really intentional about your outreach so that they're not just getting lost in the sauce of all the other, you know, inbox spam. That might mean making a call. Sending a personalized, you know, note to somebody and scheduling a time to chat when they can fully think about it. Absolutely. We had an organizational rebrand of a new website that has been going through like a lot of planning and planning and a lot of planning. I would also say we really need to be strategic now and be like, who are we going to speak about? Individuals, I would. I would just say specifically, that's what we're going to think about the major donor base. Who's in that top 20 percent of a really strong legacy donor of your organization? Who can be really committed? Unfortunately, there's so many complex components that have to be contributed to a particular foundation that need to have that. So where are those individuals that are really supportive of the work that you want to have done? We do have some folks, not, not from that one that I'm remembering in my hand, you have had a community foundation in your neighborhood that has done sort of toolbox things that used to be a thing here uh, with the community foundation for greater Atlanta. That's something that moved away from in recent years. But in your community, there may be some sort of you know, community foundation opportunities for strategic planning in particular. What we have seen be really successful during COVID and since 
um, have been really creative events that sort of break the mold. So, for example, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights um, here in Atlanta, they have started producing a play every year instead of doing a traditional you know, dinner where they get awards and that sort of thing. And it directly ties back to their mission. They celebrate some, you know, uh, moment in time from the civil rights era. And it has been wildly successful, both with corporate and major media media. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have a few more Mentioned Ms. Mansman a few times. This is what we're kind of referring to here, right? So, how you're identifying using that relationship mapping tool. And that can be, that can go related to individuals, foundations, family things, your corporate connections, whoever that may be. That should be inclusive of all of the various ways that you are into the different types of things and things that you work with. How do you identify you can make a qualifying one? What does it look like to introduce them to those things? What is your program calendar? Where are those opportunities to help them to help them? And then this will give a chance to ask themselves, right? And in a way, you're going to have to ask them a few times because the world is not going to be better. That's what you're going to want to ask. So, how are you using the mindful information you're asking? Different times of year that you're asking? And how, how often are you coming? But when we ask people to small and then the follow-up group check. So when we think about sort of the percentage breakdown of this job, the identification and quantifying is like 5% of the time. It's lower. Like you do have a CRM system 
is the lowest for that. The stewardship afterwards is actually the most critical and should take up the rest of the time. So people are really narrower, more likely to forget again if they think you don't worry about them because most people think you shouldn't do it. So the patient is not going to this is once they receive thank you for it, how are you continuing to stay engaged so that the next time they're hearing from you is not messed up for them. It is they are very aware of what what are those touch points that are Seven touch points throughout the year. If it's something about like the top 10 to 15 percent of my portfolio management, they're probably going to repeat those 15 times a year. Like that seven should be a baseline number that you're working with all the time. It's going to be how often you're hearing from them. Or it might be something like that. I think we're going to get a message to fix that thing. How would you want to engage? What is the next thing you're going to do? Yeah. Great. We're about to get together with you and tell me a little bit more about your work. Tell me about the things you want. Similarly, Prospect mentioned they volunteer with an organization similar to yours. Who's that? What's 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 that? Yeah, share a little bit about your organization. What is it? I do it to get inside the work. It's great. What can you do? Great. Um, I mean, here's some information you might need to work on today. How would you want to do that? Yeah. Fred mentions that the cost of this for your company is going to be a huge cost. What's the move? Dinner? But also, would it personally be? You do not want to have a cheap girl, right? You don't feel like, hey, this is just to leave company. Let's talk about how we can help you reinvest those values. It may be that if you know what they're giving to you, that is the right number. But going back to that identification qualification piece for those individuals is important. You want to make sure you're making the right ask at the right time. And Randy said, for early cultivation, you need 15 months, right? And then you better to give it up for the most time. And the prospect tells you they're here to town and looking for 15 people. That's not good. So, Justin, you're like, well, what are we doing? Inviting to volunteer with us. Yeah. We're inviting to volunteer with us to meet you. Right? Invite them to you. Okay, we have a kid who works at ADHD. Are you able to get some other focus to them? That's an education. Great. Oh my gosh, we have a program that actually does that on a weekly program every week. Who has an option? That's one of the best parts about this. My number one most requested friend of support. First of all, they have to. Let's invite them to be on the menu at option committee. Because that gets them out, gets them involved in the community, they get to know the local businesses in their area. Put them on that option committee. So we're going to talk a little bit about creating your case for support. How many folks in the room feel like they you know what a case for support is and that yours is particularly strong? Anybody? Yes? All right. You want to tell us a little bit about your organization and what you do? So, uh, Absolutely. So he gave a great example of repeating it a little bit today. So your case for support is your single greatest storytelling tool. Um, it can take many forms, as you can see here. We'll talk about some of these individually. But the single greatest sort of storytelling um, exercise that you can do is to craft what we 
internally at our company call a one with life in it. Um, you might say it's your four with life, four is a writing grant. So it is distilling down to the most compelling, effective, motivating language possible. What makes your organization unique, who you're helping, and why it's important. So if you can distill all of that down into some really well-crafted language that you can have on yourself, and then you can pull out pieces. You can copy and paste. We all know every great portal has a different word count, different character count. But if you have some set language that you know is approved by your ED, your career development chair, whoever the case may be, you can copy and paste and pull that language into a number of applications. Now, you may tweak it. Obviously, your team of the elevator pitch is very different than, you know, if you're writing a debt for a potential capital campaign or you're doing a free application. But you have the base of the foundation of all of those sort of written elements. And the goal from the general rule is to spend 80% of your time reducing the content and spend 20% of your time creating. So keep that 80 20 rule in mind. You should not be spending all of your time in writing content for free or free. Absolutely. And you'll see on here social content. I know that all of you struggle with creating enough social content. It's for every organization that wants to get into some sort of larger project. Keeping fresh social content going is a struggle. Guess what? No one is watching and seeing every single post that you make except for you. Recycle. If you look at some of your favorite brands, your favorite influencers online, they are reposting content year over year. And for you as the casual scrolling on your phone, you don't notice, notice the difference unless you go back to the page and stop, you know, cycle through 13 years of history. So similarly, for your newsletter content, your social media content, you can recycle content over and over again. Just, you know, throw some new words in and make sure your impact numbers are always fresh and up to date. So again, um, thinking about these are sort of the key points to always make sure are part of that poster support. Um, again, why is this an issue? Um, so, Susanna, you look so like it doesn't do us really that much good to just do a laundry list of all the activities in the program that we are spending all of our time doing. Why do we have to do them? Right. So, why is this particular issue that you're trying to solve a problem for your community? Or, if you are an arts organization, why is this presentation or this program a vital, you know, creative outlet for your community? Um, why do I why do I care about addressing this issue? Why is it a real problem? How does this problem? What does it actually mean to real people on the ground in my community? Um, who is impacted by the issue? This is um, we talk a lot about on our team, and we have some blogs about this on our website about making sure that the beneficiaries of your work or your partners in your work are being um, recognized with agency throughout your uh, written content. So making sure that there is a human face to all of your work um, really brings the message home to people who, again, would otherwise not care. And then who will be impacted by this issue being solved? If my organization completely eradicates A, B, C, or D this year, what does that do for my community and then on a larger scale, you know, humanity as a whole? And I know that sounds aspirational and lofty, but that is precisely where you get to be aspirational in your case of support. Uh, there's a great thing to touch on. I talk about this all the time. I talk to different people all the time. It is uh, Simon Sinek, who is 20 years old now. A video TikTok video called The Power of Why. And it is a perfect title for you to go into it because they're updating the language. And it's really, I highly recommend it to watch that as a good sort of how should we be talking about this? Because I think we often come into every individual site, what programs we do, what services are coming up, what's providing. And it is the absolute best way to just watch someone's face immediately break into it as it happens, right? 
Um, and so it's important in thinking about all of these questions and how to rephrase it really just for the conversation and to get to the next level. Who's going to come around with the mic? Okay. That's a really good question. So I think, you know, if you had the dollars and the funding to go out and help you make money and facilitate a strategic plan and all of that, fantastic, great. If you want to do that, you can do that. You do that without the group. But if you're doing that internally, a couple of good places to start are how do you look into your book and your system? How do you design the audience for your book? Have you started to look into your scope and your program so that they do see you? What are they looking for? What do they need? What do they feel like you can do really well? And taking a really hard look at your organization and saying, these are the, this is what we're doing for our community in terms of what they want to see. This is what we know that we respond to well and that we do well. Um, and then also, where do we still see a gap, right? So this may be what we've been doing, but we are really seeing that if we could add this component to our organization, we would be able to make it even less meaningful. So really looking at the kind of strengths you can leverage and lean into, the, you know, sort of next step adjacent opportunities that you can be mindful of. And also the strategic plan is a good opportunity to also look at what's not going well or what may be a kind of gap that is going to impact your work as well that you need to kind of move across the board. So it's a really hard to explain that list of it. Um, but it's a really helpful exercise to do that. It's just kind of what you're calling it at, align it to what you're doing for your community, what you think both internal and external that can be staff for, but also people that you can serve and really using that as a good kind of reference model for the organization to see how you can really do things that you feel you can do better. And then from there, that gives you confidence to take it to your funders to kind of jolt the You know, your your plan might have been because it's not going to be the whole world. If you, most strategic plans are written sort of in a three or five year structure. So if you know in year one and two, we do not have secure funding to be able to do all of these top priorities that we've outlined, it's looking at how you can phase that realistically across the three or five years and then putting into place. You know, the capacity building can actually make that happen, whether that's, you know, to actually to grow another, you know, half a million dollars a year, we know we're going to need to invest in another staff person. Or if we know we're not getting near enough grants as we should for the type of work that we're doing, maybe it's hiring a great writer or outsourcing great writing. So that's how you sort of map up your priority areas and sort of aspirational programs to the realities of the world. So one more question right here. Thank you, ladies, for this presentation. Thank you. Um, so for those organizations that are funded at the different levels of this plan, just touch the fact that you have to take this plan to the next phase of the plan. So, um, and also it's a lot of work when you're starting to get to the next level. And so it's like, well, if we do that, we're going to draw them. So on the peer to peer end of the approach, what have you found to be successful for the investment of that work and still make it through the peer to peer? So we work with a number of really small organizations, so like half a million dollars in the dollar range or under. Um, we have one organization in particular that I can give a good example for. It's called Central Outreach, and that's a C center that they run here permanently in Atlanta, right near um, City Hall. And they serve you know, a homelessness population, and they help them with um, all kinds of services and signups for them, social security benefits, things like that. They're a great little organization, very tiny staff that are primarily focused on programming. So 
of the fundraising is up to the as a solo person. And they really used to have things to have like you know, traditional events. It raised, you know, an okay amount, but again, like you said, it wasn't necessarily the stress and burnout that it was causing on their team because your program and staff, it's not like they can just stop their programs while they shift into producing, you know, an excellent event. Um, so, a few years ago, you know, during COVID, everybody had to rethink, well, what am I doing for this event? We can't all, you know, gather 500 people in a room and have to kick them down. So, I use that a lot. <laughs> so, they, um, they actually use it as an opportunity to think back and think about, okay, what's an event that actually speaks to our mission and the people that we serve in a more direct way? And so, they actually did some research and found the number of steps or the average number of miles that a homeless person or a person experiencing homelessness uh, walks in a day in the city of And so they created a walk with a big peer to peer component. So their board members, they created an event committee, everybody got in on the action to create a walking team. It was similar to a walk for life uh, model, but on a much smaller scale. And they've actually seen their participation go up and the dollars raised have been like quite equal from what they were making on this traditional event. Um, they did get their board uh, very involved and the system committee very involved so that it would not put all of that pressure on the program staff. So that's one um, example. And I think for a lot of organizations, Thinking about events that do directly speak more closely to your mission, for me, sometimes it seems odd for, you know, uh, a hunger organization to be doing a multi course in a space together. It just seems a little incongruous to their mission. And I think when you can tie the mission to the event, it really makes a strong um, emotional pace and also financial pace. Since you're, you know, across multi states, 
and it creates a sense of community, even if you are you know, far away from each other. So thinking about creative ways to leverage technology, sometimes people like to feel like they're a part of the action. So even if you are doing some sort of on, um, on-site program, just like this event, they're doing a live stream. Now, most of us don't have the budget to pull off a full live stream, but maybe somebody on your board or your advisory board or even one of your staff members could do a FaceTime or like a live feed on your um, LinkedIn or Instagram account while an event is happening. It sort of gives people an opportunity to feel like they're there, particularly if there's some kind of like live auction element or some kind of on-site sort of technology. Yeah, what you said that also made me think about an important piece of this too, which is you really want to think of all the community and the community to want to. So generational intent on it is a really real thing when it comes to fundraising decisions. So if the majority of your donors are if you do 60 plus kind of agents, the types of communications that are going to be best received are going to look a lot different than if your organization has primarily um, and so I think also being mindful of what that generational makeup of your donor base looks like is really important in making sure you're meeting your donors where they are. So we know, for instance, for that kind of Gen Z age range, they're most responsive to social media driven um, engagement and interaction. For 60 plus, they want a phone call, they want to take video, they probably want to be on still more near in the vicinity and are able to meet with them in person. They're going to want to do that. If it's millennial age, sort of geriatric millennial like myself, then they're looking for email outreach actually is the best way to get them. If you can call them on the phone, then you're going to hide in the closet and they'll never want to come to you again. So thinking about that, right, like what is the generational makeup of that base and segmenting it appropriately so that you're reaching out to folks where they are too. Thank you.